as I start today, I want to ask a very, very important question, which is, when did India truly get its independence? The answer that most people give is 1947, which is not wrong. The only problem with that is, uh, it's when we got our political independence. But I believe that we, di we did not get our independence until 1991, which was uh, the liberalization movement or the free market movement, or I call it the second freedom movement. So let me tell you what happened. Post-independence from 1947 to 1991, we followed everything that the Soviet Union did. We followed the Soviet economic model, that means all the communism, socialistic models, we had the same thing going on here. The five-year plans, we were doing the same thing. And 1990, 1990, something happened. The collapse of the Soviet Union. The great Soviet Union that was apparently not so great. All of a sudden, our cabinet ministry, followed by P. V. Narsimharao, Montek Singh Alwalia, um, our ex-prime minister, um, and uh, Subramanyam Swami all got together and said, hey, in two weeks, our balance of payments is going to replenish. Our wheat, um, our wheat reserves, our oil reserves, and our gold reserves are going to die. We need to do something. What do we need to do? We need to open our economy. They quickly came together, wrote a liberalization, and sent it to the Americans. And this was done the way we study for exams right before. But nevertheless, it was a day that changed India forever. That's all cool, but why is free market such a big deal? Free market is a big deal because before free market, the way India was run was by License Raj. What is License Raj? License Raj is the type of economy that's controlled by the government. That means every industry is nationalized. Licenses for business is controlled by the government. All banks are nationalized. For example, if I wanted to be a biscuit factory maker, I could be Parler or Britannia, and if I wanted to like go into the biscuit business, and if Parler is already there, Britannia cannot be there. That's the kind of economy that License Raj created. Also, no foreign investment or no foreign companies. So let me tell you what India 1991 was versus India 2020 is. If you're a consumer, let's just say, and you wanted to buy a scooter, your only option was a Bajaj scooter. But today, a brand new KTM Duke, not a bad idea, right? And any other bike that you want. If you wanted to buy a car, your only option is a Premier Padmini. Versus today, I recently bought a Kia Seltos. Versus if you wanted to watch television, your only option is a DD National. Versus today, we li live in the Netflix economy. Well, who even watches DD National today? And if you wanted to buy a computer, let's just give you an example. Narayan Murthy, the CEO of Infosys, wanted to buy a computer, and he went to Delhi 50 times in the 1990 to import a computer from the US versus today you can Amazon it. And our IT industry is worth $350 billion. Post-liberalization, our economy did a whooping 7.5%. Until then, we did a 3.3%. And we were called the Hindu rate of growth. All of a sudden, the India story changed. The whole world started to look at us. We started to hit an average of 7.5%. Well. All of this is cool, you may be asking me, why does this matter? Because this had a huge impact on my life. This is not a social studies lecture, this is the story of my life. I come from a very middle class family, just like Alawai Kuntapuram Lo, my dad was the biggest villain in my life. He always used to say, my son is gonna get an IIT. On the other hand, I used to fail every single college lecture, school lecture, school exams. I don't even know how I got out of school, got out of school to be honest with you. In spite of all of this, I had an opportunity to go to the US for my undergraduation. And all the extended society and my friends, family, all they had to say was one thing. Why would you send him abroad? That doesn't make sense. When he can't do it locally, how can he do it globally? 
But my dad, who was apparently the villain of my story, became the hero and he said, it's fine, let's just take a bet. We never know what's going to work out. And that's when I went to the University of Minnesota. It's the university that Shraves goes in happy days for reference. Uh, now, I went to the US and I was like, new country, new system, new opportunity, let's get it. I'm going to do well here. I'm not going to fail anymore. And that was the spirit. I thought I was going to do OK, because, well, we're not in the rat race anymore. We're in the US. That means I should do well, right? But that was not the case. I failed the first semester. Then I failed the second semester. Then I came back to India for summer holidays. And this is the email I received from my college. It reads out. I mean, it's not super clear. But let me just summarize what it says is, Aditya, you're suspended from the University of Minnesota. You can no longer take classes. What that means is your visa is terminated. Do not come back to the US. Do not board the flight. Written very clearly. Thank you so much for that. But that does not help. I mean, um, my family took a big bet against me. It was like uh, my dad's a startup investor, and he said, my son is a startup. Let's just take a hit on him, we'll see what happens. But the email also mentioned something else, is that you can petition if you feel that you deserve another chance. And I wrote a petition. I said, give me another chance. I deserve another chance. And my petition was accepted. I go back to the US. But the problem was, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Academics is not my thing. How do I make it? I need to make past this, but I don't see it. That's when one of my friends came to me and pitched an idea. He said, let's connect students to tutors on an app. And uh, what do you think? I was like, idea sounds great, but how are you going to make it happen? He said, Aditya, you go find developers. We'll see how to make it happen. Me trying to be the helpful friend that I am, I was like, uh, let's just find him some developers. Uh, they're they're going to be somewhere. But that's when it actually hit me. The light bulb moment, two fundamental questions. How many entrepreneurs in America that just don't know how technology works but want to start a technology company versus how much talent do we know in India that feel like they're not getting the right opportunity? They want to be a part of something great, something larger, but they end up working in the back offices of Oracle and Microsoft. I said, if I can capture the right talent and make them work on the right ideas, money, money, money. And I quickly made a team in the US, started working on this idea. And not before, in a single year, we were able to do really, really well. And we ended up winning the Super Bowl Startup Showcase, which in 2018 calendar year was one of the biggest events in Minnesota, the state that I was in. As soon as we won that, I was on the front page of Minnesota Daily the next day. What happened? At, at the same time, a local magazine picked me as a 25 under 25 Minnesota technologists in a single calendar year for my suspension. Something happened, right? I mean, like uh, we went from suspension to Super Bowl to success overnight. There, there is obviously like some level of cockiness that built. We became arrogant. And that's when the party culture started. It was all just party. I mean, we threw the biggest parties in Hyderabad. Um, and our employees became reluctant. And uh, we messed up every single project. The deadline was nearing, and we didn't have something to submit. And we said, Wait, wait, wait. We know some people in Geetam Vizag that are apparently super intelligent that can come in and help us get to where we need to be. So we got these students in. We flew them out from Vizag to Hyderabad to start working on these ideas. And all of a sudden, these students were able to do stuff that my full-time employees were not able to do. I, we all said, that we're missing something here. Students are better than our full-time employees. Obviously, we're doing something wrong. That's when we said, let's go research. Let's talk to students, and let's try to understand what do the students actually want. We did a research project. What we did is our marketing head, who is here with us, Pranay, went from Cargill 
to Kanyakumari on a single motorcycle, talking to all different universities and students across the, India on what they want, what are their problems, are they frustrated, how can we create a better future for them. And this trip was also recognized by Times of India and Business Standard. And Business Standard claimed it as a uniting all IT geeks of India through a motorcycle trip. We learned one thing. The students said they were not happy. This is one theme that we saw across all over India. We talked to 15 different universities. Students said they were not happy because they, the system was not working for them. They were working for the system. They said they did not have a say. They said they wanted to be a, some, part of something greater, and the greater was not given to them. They said they wanted to learn the best new skills that are on the market today. And they wanted to also do projects. They wanted to make money. They wanted to do all of these things, but they just didn't have that. So we said, we're going to launch something called as a fountain club. So we put, just like a music club or a TEDx club, we have a fountain club that we started in various universities across India. And in a single calendar year, what we've realized is students are doing great work. They love the program. They were learning all the new technologies that we taught them. And in a single year, these are the stats that we were able to do. In s we're now present in six different universities, Geetam Vizag, Bits Goa, Bits Hyderabad, Christ University, and Watson School of Design, Nift Hyderabad. And what we're able to do is we're able to teach new technologies to students give them the opportunity to learn. And once they learn, they want to do projects. So we gave them the projects. As soon as they did the projects, we said, we're going to give you small parts of our paid projects, and we're going to pay you for that. In a single year, we were able to create employment for students part-time, so gig economy. Students made a minimum of 11,000 rupees and a maximum of 40,000 rupees every month while they were working for us. And they cumulatively created 16 products that we now launched into the market, and at the same time created 14 lakh rupees worth for themselves. Today, we've, un we've launched more than 10 companies globally. At the same time, we helped dig uh, te uh, brick and mortar companies get digital. We went from three employees making 56,000 rupees revenue annually in our first year, to now, and that Dabba office on the left too, to three offices globally in San Francisco, Minneapolis, and Hyderabad, 53 employees on the track to do a million dollars this year. Now I start to think, what is that that changed? How are we able to do this? And one fundamental trend is the answer to my question. That's the internet. The internet in the US alone created forex the value of what the traditional industries like information or manufacturing did in the last 15 years. This growth was due to the five big tech like Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Apple. They have accumulated $5 trillion of market cap. This is what is the new revolution in today's society. That is underrated. In India alone, we have our very own success story, Flipkart story. Started in 2007 by two guys, Bini and Sachin. In 10 years, created 120,000 crores value for the shareholders and themselves. The power of the internet is to scale and reach to as many people as possible. Now, let me make a case, my final case. Why is India 2020 where the world is at? That's because today we have 650 million active users digitally on the internet. What this means is that we are the second largest digital market after China and the first largest open market because China is not an open market. The world wants to be here because there's more opportunity than any other place. This growth is fueled by two trends. The smartphones becoming 6,000 or less cheaper than that went from 100 million people to 200 million people from 2016 to 2017 on the internet. 2017, something happened. 
Reliance Geo happened and the Geo effect got 350 more million more people in less than two years. Now, today we're standing in 2020 with 650 million people on the internet. What that means is what the question I want to be asked. Why is all of this a big deal? All of this is a big deal is because India, which I believe was fundamentally not meritocratic, all of a sudden today, which is a free market, and an internet-led free market, suddenly doesn't care if you are a Hindu or a Muslim, a man or a woman, old or young, all it cares is do you have a value prop or not? Can you add value to the system? And the system, because of your value, is that greater? And the beauty about the system is that the system rewards you back for this. This is the India I wanted to see. And this is the India full of opportunities. I'm, I just want to be honest, and this is my last quote before I move on, is you only get to play this game once. You have only one life. You don't have multiple lives. Until, unless you're a reincarnation believer. But not really, though. It's, you just have one life. Just make it count. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Aditya Siripragara today, and I'm happy to announce India 2020 is an opportunity for all of us. Make it count.